Well, thank you for joining in tonight. Thank you for all the folks who are willing to come and help us uh, do these, this service tonight as far as a live stream and the music and the lights and the sound. It takes a lot to make this thing go move forward. I appreciate all the help and appreciate the folks, especially who are singing behind me in the choir. They did a great job. You may have noticed that Brother Mitchell is in the choir tonight. And... Uh, you say, well, now, wh why would you do that, Brother Howell? He, he never sings in choir. He shouldn't sing in choir. And, uh, well, there's one reason, folks. And here he come, Here it is right here. He brings me a water. <laughs> there's one more reason. That wasn't why. The, the real reason is, if I got to preach to a, an auditorium, I want Brother Mitchell yelling, all right? And so... <laughs> And uh, you may not hear that like I can hear it, but it helps me, encourages me a lot, I tell you what. If you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 10, if you would, Luke chapter 10. And I sure appreciate just your flexibility, your willingness to work with us and through us through this time. I want to thank the staff especially. They've just done a tremendous job. Secretaries, school teachers with the school work out to the students. They're working on those things right now with some videos. And our pastoral staff has just done a phenomenal job. I have uh, thrown them tons and lots and lots of ideas and they have not complained. They've just jumped in and said, we can do this, we can do that. I think when I've left the conversation, I think they've said that I'm crazy under their breath, in their minds, or out loud. But they have just done a great, a great job all really that you see they've orchestrated and got together and I just gave them some ideas and we're looking forward to see what God will do many of you may notice that online there is a, a new website we put that little sticker or that little uh, uh, slide on Facebook that says COVID-19 pray.com and I think God can use this time and use us during this time to help folks in a way that we wouldn't be able to touch them another way and I would submit that if we can encourage people with prayer during this time. What I mean by that is if, if you know someone who may be struggling, you say, listen, let our church pray for you. Would you go here? Can I get your information? We'll have someone call you. We'd love to pray with you. Of course, we'll call back and we'll uh, enlist some of your help to call people back. And of course, we want to give the gospel as well. And I think God will use this time. We're working on some other things as well. Had a member, good member call me today with a great idea. I won't announce it yet uh, as we flush it out, but, but we're moving forward and we're looking forward, all right? We're not sitting here saying, oh no, what are we going to do we're sitting here saying oh no what can we do and this is just an amazing time for the lord to work in a special way i'm going to announce now what we're going to do sunday i think there's a slide for it as well but this sunday we are calling outreach sunday why not have outreach sunday during the coronavirus it's a perfect time for outreach sunday and this is what outreach sunday means i want everyone to look for someone that they can be an outreach to this sunday now, what that looks like may be different in your situation, but let me give you some ideas. I'd love for some of you to invite your neighbors over to watch the service Sunday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Wouldn't it be great if all our church were able to invite one unsaved family with them? Now, that morning, maybe, though we can't provide you coffee and donuts, maybe you'll get yourself some coffee and donuts Sunday morning. That'd be great. Outreach Sunday. Maybe some people are nervous about that, but could you, could you have them log in at 11 o'clock? Call them in the morning. Hey, remember, we're, we're playing the service this morning, and uh, would you log in? And I think this Sunday, at a time when it wouldn't make sense for people, right, to be part of church, well, now we can have a, a special emphasis on that. I'm going to be preaching Sunday morning. This is my sermon title, Diagnosis, Hope. All right, Diagnosis, Hope. That's a sermon Sunday morning. What's it about, Pastor Howell? Well, that's all I got so far. No. <laughs> so so y'all pray for me. No. <laughs> Now, so we're looking forward to it. Now, along the way, some of you good folks in our church uh, may need some help. May need some help with computers, technical assistance. And, it, and if we can help you, you call the, in the church office. And uh, we've had our guys already go out and help some families get uh, set up on that. So maybe some of the older folks are a little uh, confused sometimes. We'd love to give you a hand with that. And so you reach out to us, and we'll do our best to help you if we can. And uh, with that, I'd encourage everyone to connect with us on Facebook. Right now, we're rolling out a lot of information on Facebook. My wife and I have been doing some videos. I've been doing some videos, rolling some information on Facebook. And this is a great time to jump on there, like the First Baptist Church page, follow the page, and you'll be up to date on all the information. All right, maybe even more up to date than I am if you just follow Facebook. So that'll be a big help. And then some churches, and I think it's an excellent idea, are helping some of their older folks who maybe can't get out for groceries or something like that to maybe help deliver some of those things. And if we can be help, you let us know. I can't promise that we can bring you toilet paper at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
right? And I'm not paying for your toilet paper. It's really expensive right now. But if we can be a help or extra encouragement, you, you reach out to us. And if we can do something, I can make that work. I would like to do that. And, and in a special way, minister to the folks of First Baptist Church and to all of the Saginaw County. All right, Luke chapter 10. Tonight, I want to ask us tonight in Luke chapter 10 to look at something where God redirects us. Luke chapter 10, God redirects us. In verse number 2, Jesus says this, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Lord, I thank you for this time tonight. Lord, I ask that you would use me in a special, in a, in a, in a way tonight that I can take no credit for. Lord, I pray your spirit would touch me and fill me. Help me to say those things that would be helpful and true to your word. And Lord, if there's something that would be confusing or not further your cause, your gospel, Lord, strike it from my mind or even my notes. Lord, may we be good soil as we listen to your word. Would your spirit work in our hearts? Lord, I pray again and ask that during this time in the United States and in Michigan, that your people, the Christians, who claim to have faith in you, would be used by you in a special way. That we would have scores of people touched by the gospel, souls saved, Lord. That you would grow your church during this time. That it would not shrink and we would gather more for your harvest right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a moment where you ask yourself, what in the world am I doing? Maybe it's a time when you're about to jump out of an airplane. What in the world am I doing? Am I doing bungee, uh, a bungee rope jump? Maybe riding a motorcycle. What in the world am I doing? My, uh, my father for a lot of years has taught driver's education. I've asked him some of those stories, but I one time was riding with him and in his car, he had on the passenger side a brake. I've seen those brakes for years. I've always wanted to push one. I'm sure you have as well. Now, my dad has pushed the brake on, on students who he thought was being, were being unsafe. So we were driving somewhere, and I'm in the passenger seat. My father's in the driver's seat. We're coming up to the stoplight, and I, in my normal joking self, slammed on the brake. I thought, what am I doing? But my father then asked, what are you doing? Have you ever had as a parent a what are you doing moment like that? I'm going to ask us tonight to consider this question. If Jesus were to ask us that question, what would be our answer? He is watching us tonight, but if, if he were to say, what are you doing right now? What would our answer be? Well, Lord, I'm, I'm running around freaking out of my mind. That's what I'm doing. I'm speeding around to every store tracking down shipments of toilet paper. That's what I'm doing. It's so bad now that today we saw it at the gas station. They sell rolls and rolls of toilet paper. What are you doing while well, I'm reading every new Facebook article that shows up in my feed about COVID-19? That's what I'm doing. What in the world are you doing? I want tonight to point to this verse where there are three uh, questions I'll ask about this verse in regards to our outlook right now. The, the first question is this, what are you looking at? What are we looking at? Jesus said, therefore he said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. I would submit there's a recognition right here. Jesus quickly gets our eyes back on the main problem. You see, it's so easy to have our eyes focus on another problem. There's so many problems that can pop up in our life. There are health problems. There are marriage problems, retirement problems, house problems, job problems. Water in the basement problems. This is a real first world problem at the Howell House. I tell you what, water in the basement, it causes consternation in my life. But it seems like Jesus brings us back and brings the disciples back and says, listen, there's a problem. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. But what are you looking at right now? Right now it seems that everyone's looking at the coronavirus, right? COVID-19, that's what we're looking at. We look around and say, well, how will I make it? The, the, the what ifs, what's going to happen in 16 months from now? No one has any idea except for Jesus. 
What's going to happen next week? Is it going to spread through Michigan? Will we have, will we hit 70 cases or something like that? Or, or, or will it, will it sweep the nation? Will my 401k come back up? You realize that we've had a lot of natural disasters and calamities in our lifetime. I'm talking about me, myself. In fact, FEMA has this many disaster declarations. They've already had 66 disaster declarations in 2020. 66 of them. In 2019, they had 101 declarations of disaster. 2018, there's 124. In 2017, there was 137. 2016, 103. 2015, 80. 2014, 84. 2013, 95. 2012, 112. 2011, 242. There are always going to be problems that will take our eyes off the main problem. They say, Brother Howell, 2019, I don't remember 101 different natural disasters. What happened in 2019? Well, Alaska had earthquakes. North Carolina had tropical storms. Mississippi had flooding. And the list goes on and on and on. The question is, what are we, what are you looking at? What am I looking at? Jesus brings us back with recognition to the main problem. You see, when we look at the wrong things, it causes us to be distracted. It distracts us. Oh, it's easy to get distracted. I get distracted while I'm driving. You say, Brother Howell, what, what distracts you? Anything. The person next to me. The police officer way down the road when I'm going 71 in a 70. The person next to me who's doing something they should never do while they're driving. I looked up some things that people do while they drive. Makeup was a top offense of ladies. I'm assuming it's ladies, I guess. Diaper changes? Now, who would change the, a, a baby's diaper while you drive? Now, I know it must smell terrible, but that's just a recipe for disaster. I mean, just imagine... No, don't imagine. Never mind. I won't go down that road. It, it's a problem. Wardrobe changes. I just wonder, how many folks have ever changed clothes or changed article of clothing while you drove? Confession time. I've tied ties while I've dri driven down the road. Tied my shoes. Have you done that before? Yeah. Of course, texting and driving. You see, when we're distracted, or when our eyes are off the, the, the focus, we become distracted. I shared this at youth conference, but a few years back, you may not remember this. It was a Sunday afternoon at, at our house on Airport Road. I came out of the bathroom there, uh, my bedroom, going to the bathroom, and right there, there was a corner of the wall that I promptly hit, all right, with my forehead. I got up from my naps, so it was around 3.30 or so, coming back to church here Sunday afternoon, about 4.15 to 4.40, you know, for practices. Because I was distracted, I now had this large red mark on my forehead. I was leading songs during that time, and so all I could think of really was not about myself, no pain, but like, this thing will not leave my head before I get to church. I'm rubbing it like this. And this wonderful church, Pastor, like this wonderful church, the First Baptist Church, the whole time I'm leading songs, People were pointing. <laughs> Great, yes. Yes, I know it's there, right? It happened because I was distracted. You see, if we get distracted during this time, we're going to hit the wall of problems. We're going to be distracted. You see, when, we're just, when, when our focus is wrong, not only does it distract us, but it distances us from what's important. You see, when you focus on the problem, that's not God's problem, you're not on the same page as God, and you're not walking with God. How can two walk together except they be agreed? You see, I can focus over here, but God's focusing over here. I'm looking at this over here, but, but God's looking over here. It begins to distance thee from Jesus. What are you looking at? It begins to hinder us or to deter us. Don't be distracted because you begin to look at the wrong things. There's a lot of occasions for a faulty gaze right now. Every TV channel you turn on, every Facebook feed that comes across your path, everyone it seems you talk to, what do you think? What's going to happen? You go to Sam's Club, you go to Walmart, and you see people grabbing everything they can possibly grab, it seems. I was in Walmart earlier today. The strangest things are off the shelves. The strangest things. Of course, you know of toilet paper, but now it seems all paper towels are also gone. 
Because if Armageddon happens, you must have plenty of paper towels. Everyone knows that. Bottled water. It's a real problem. Because I can't even turn on my faucet any longer. I have plenty of water in my faucet. Don't be distracted because you look at the wrong things. Someone said this, if you can smile, when everything else seems to be going wrong, then you're probably a plumber working on a Sunday. <laughs> or you're a Christian Amen. with a great God. What are, you, what are you looking at? This verse directs our gaze back to the real problem. But then as I look at this verse, Jesus says this, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. What are you looking at, but who are you talking to? I see a recognition, but then I see a reliance. He says to pray to the Lord of the harvest, the one who is in control, the one who is the master of everything, the one who can actually do something about the problem, the one who can actually get you a resolution. Have you ever had to call charter? When you finally get connected to a real person, no one thing, whoever you talk to, cannot help you. Hang up and call again. I've been connected, it seems like, to every country around the globe in search of an elusive answer to a problem. But you know what? We can always come back to the Lord of the harvest. He can always answer the problem. The problem is we seem to talk to the wrong people. Facebook answers never seem to help anyone long term. I read this uh, just yesterday that a man was having a problem in his marriage. Here was the problem. His wife had racked up about $200,000 in debt, schooling debt. What I read in law school. That wasn't the problem. It seems like that'd be a problem, but apparently that wasn't the problem. The problem was that now she was about done with law school and she didn't want to be a lawyer any longer. She wanted to do something else that would pay, according to his post, about or around $34,000 a year. And he said, not only that, she wants to work for just a couple of years and start a family. We can't do this. Am I being a jerk for making her be a lawyer was his, was his question. Well, now I was fully engaged in this story. I began to read the responses. You can imagine the responses that came across, uh, across this story. And they ranged, as you can imagine, all over. All over. From, tell her she must go to work. Right, okay, good idea. To let her live her dream. To she's being selfish, you're being selfish. At the end of the day, if you had read all those posts, I didn't read all of them, but I read enough of them to know that there was no real help right there. He'd asked the internet world and gotten an internet world answer. How about this right now? How to stay away from the coronavirus. Spray your nose with water and use a hair dryer. Have you seen this? It's, it's out there. It's out there. You can, you, you can look it up. Spray, spray water into your nose carefully and then use a hair dryer until it hurts. But then stop. This will keep you from getting the coronavirus. Now this is fake news. But there's got to be some junior hire out there who's crazy enough to try this thing. Don't. Don't. Or this one right now for the coronavirus, eating garlic. Eating garlic. The only thing I figure that's good for is definitely help you with the social distancing. It'll make it easier for everyone else. This is just the coronavirus. You can, you can spend your time with false information and false solutions. Who are you talking to? And Jesus says, there's a problem out there, but there's someone who can solve the problem. There's a problem solver. It's the Lord of the harvest. See, we talk to the wrong people, but we live in ignorance. I'm scared. I'm alone. No one knows the trouble that I face. There are people all around us who are scared and fearful in ignorance. And we, we, Christian, we have the answer. We can pray to the Lord of the harvest. I encourage us tonight to talk to the problem solver. The personal savior, the powerful sovereign, the preserving supplier, the providential supporter, the perfect source. His name is Jesus and he's the Lord of the harvest. Don't go to the wrong source. Only Jesus has the answers for life problems. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can fix a broken life. 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Who are you talking to? What are you looking at? And lastly tonight, what are you asking for? What are you asking for? There's a recognition, a reliance, and there's a request here. Jesus asked us to pray for laborers. Someone said it this way, the only prayer request that Jesus asked of us. I've been asked as a pastor to pray for a lot of things. Pastor, pray for my surgery. Pray for, for this job promotion or job interview. And those are good things. I'm happy and privileged to help you pray for those things. Lord, uh, Pastor, pray for uh, my, my, my daughter. Pray for my son. and Pray for this. Pray for that. Those are wonderful things. And we're allowed to and we ought to pray for those things. And we're encouraged to pray for those things. But when Jesus asks me and asks you to pray for something, don't you think we ought to pray for that? Maybe a little more than just what I want to pray about. Maybe what He wants me to pray about. Those things aren't wrong to pray for, but what is Jesus asking for? Sometimes we just pray for a solution that we want to have. But Jesus is looking for something else. I had the privilege Monday and Tuesday of preaching a revival for Brother Treadway. Came back and last night, my kids, before we're going to leave this morning to come back for this service, I want to be here in this pulpit to preach for you tonight. The kids were asking, they said, Mom and Dad, can we stay? All right, you come back. And someone said, I forget who it said, they said, well, the only way for that to happen is if there's a, a cure for the coronavirus. And immediately, my son Johnny began to pray for the Lord to send a cure for the coronavirus. Now, I think there ought to be a cure, and I should think we, should, we can pray for one, right? But that was a prayer that we're often guilty of as well. Lord, do this because it's going to benefit me. We're worried right now about a job, our retirement, the unknown, the things that affect us. And yet Jesus says, hey, listen, pray for the things that I'm looking at that affect me, eternal things. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth prayer, or laborers. You see, we should never pray like we have to persuade God to what's best for me. My tendency, and your tendency is to beg and, and ask God to, to do what we think is best. And it seems in those times that our prayer life is almost like a tug of war between us and God. Confident that we know the best prayer requests. Yet Jesus says, pray for this. And in Romans, he says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. See, the easiest things to decide are what to do in somebody else's shoes. I can always give other people good advice. This is what you should have done. Of course, after the fact, not before the fact. In this case, it's easy to know what to pray for right now. Lord, send some laborers. Lord, the, the fields are white to harvest right now. There's some fear and panic out there. Lord, send some laborers. Lord, do you want me to be a, a laborer? Pray for what Jesus asks us to pray for. Recognize the harvest is ready. It's the right moment. Rely on the Lord. He's the right master. And recognize his request, what he wants, some more workers, the members. You see, it's all about perspective. The story is told about a dentist who was leaning over a patient with a hypodermic needle and was overheard to have said, you will probably only feel a prick. On the other hand, it may feel like you've been kicked in the mouth by a mule. It's perspective. Tonight I'd encourage us and challenge us that our perspective needs to get back on the perspective of Jesus Christ. He said there's a problem, but it may not be what you think the problem is. The problem is there's a harvest and there's a shortage of laborers. Right now God wants to do something in Saginaw, Michigan in 2020. God wants to use His Word, His workers for His work. Who are you talking to? Who are you looking at? And what are you asking for? Lord, I thank you for the time that we've had tonight to look at your word. Lord, I pray that you would convict us. Lord, you would touch us. Perhaps we've allowed our mind to wander to the fear 
to the unknown. And Lord, tonight we need to get our minds back focused on you. Lord, perhaps we've not spent the time in prayer that we've, we've needed to or ought to. And Lord, maybe we've been guilty of not asking you what you've asked us to ask you for. Tonight, would you take a few moments? Would you pray? Maybe you're at home and you can get down on your knees and you ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to help you to focus on what he's focusing on. You should take a moment now and let's pray. The Lord's touched you. Would you respond to him? Piano will play in just a moment. We'll have an invitation just like we do at First Baptist Church, just like you were here. If the Lord's touched your heart, you respond. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I encourage you, I beg you, I implore you tonight. The Bible says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. The Bible says we're all sinners and the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God commended, he showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he died on the cross to pay for my sin and for your sin. He is God. He came as, a, as God. And because he's God, he can pay for everyone's sin. And if you believe on him and ask him to save you, he'll do that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, if you're out there maybe watching this broadcast and you've never asked Jesus to save you, I encourage you tonight to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Often we help folks here at First Baptist Church when they want to get saved to pray a prayer like this. There's no magic in the words that are said. It's with the heart that man believeth. With a mouth confession is made, though. The prayer goes like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. I encourage you tonight that if you've never asked Jesus to save you and you want to have a home in heaven forever, would you pray that tonight? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you please save me and take me to heaven when I die? I trust you and you alone. Did you pray that just now? Did you mean that? The Bible says if you meant that, he saved you. As the piano plays, I invite the church folks, the Lord, touch your heart. You pray now. Spend some time with prayer and God right now as the instruments play.